about is the in asking about the way forward. Uh, stress the important point that we need to include the poor. So what will naturally happen in a situation like that where we have budget constraints, austerity measures, and so on, is that the rich countries will say, this is a problem for us, and we are willing to make progress. We, we try to get more revenues, and we will try to make deals with each other in such a way that we will improve our own fiscal situation. We will agree no longer to cover up for one another's tax sheets. The Germans will agree with the French, with the British, with the US, with the Japanese, we've got it up, good. But uh, the poor countries could quite easily be left out in the cold, right? Because there are not many German taxpayers or British taxpayers or American taxpayers who have secret bank accounts in Nigeria or in Ghana or in Guinea. So that's the, the big problem. And so what uh, my main concern is in this matter is to make sure that as we go forward, as this agenda, I think, becomes irresistible, it includes the interests of the poor countries. And just to give you a little background stats, we have roughly uh, a problem in the United States is roughly 2%. So 2% of tax revenues are lost to these shenanigans. In Europe, it's more like 8%. In the developing world, it's around 30%. So the developing world, on a relative basis, suffers very much more than the rich countries from these problems. So. Uh, let me start with a few facts and figures about the poverty problem. You can see here that very large numbers of people are still suffering major deprivations. And I think that's widely known. It's about half of the world's population who are suffering deprivations that are severe enough to raise questions of human rights fulfillment. And about one third of all human deaths are related to poverty related causes. They are from poverty related causes, as you can see here what they are. And that's a pretty conservative way of counting in that I have only included those causes of death that are basically unknown in the rich countries and so are pretty clearly poverty related. Uh, poor people die from the same things we die from also. So many poor people die from diabetes, heart attack, stroke and so forth, and they often die much sooner than we do because of lousy medical care and additional environmental burdens. But I've counted none of those deaths in the statistics. So even if you just count those causes that are prevalent in the poor countries and unknown in the rich countries, you already get to one third of all human deaths. If you put that in perspective, uh, that's a pretty large number, 18 million a year, 400 million over the period since the end of the Cold War. That dwarfs all the government-sponsored violence deaths of the 20th century, such as the Second World War and so on. Uh, all these things, war, civil wars, gulags, concentration camps, together killed about 200 million in the entire 20th century. Poverty killed about 400 million in just 22 years since the end of the Cold War. Now, the immediate reason why poverty remains such an enormous burden on humanity is the income distribution. So you can see here how income in the world is distributed. About 46% goes to the top 5% of the human population. About the same amount goes to the next 20%. So the top quarter has already more than 90% of global income. The other three quarters squeeze into the remaining space, and only with good eyes can you see the bottom quarter, which has 0.78% of global income as of 2005. Obviously, the wealth distribution is even more unequal because the normal person, the normal rich person, has more wealth than one annual income, and the normal poor person has considerably less. You can see this here. This data just came out two or three days ago from Credit Suisse. And what you can see is that the bottom two-thirds of the world's population has less than 3% of global wealth. The total global wealth is about $240 trillion. That's 240,000 billion. And you have about 100 of these 240 sitting just with the millionaires. 0.7% of the global population, and then another 100 goes to those between 100,000 and a million in wealth, 
which is another 7.7% of the global population. So the top 8% of the human population have 200 out of 240 trillion dollars in wealth. Now, why is that important? Because it's important because people often, when they think about poverty, think that poverty has always been with us, always will be with us. It's just a fact of life. Get used to it. It's like death. It's something necessary. And nothing could be more wrong. It's basically the case that, sure, poverty has always been with us. But for most of human history, it's been unavoidable in that there simply wasn't enough wealth or income around to avoid it. But now we have the means to overcome poverty once and for all. And the statistics show that very clearly, right? We have to get poor people from the 3% of global income that they now have, the bottom half of the human population, up to something like 5%. And we will at least have ended that life-threatening poverty that causes all these deprivations I showed you at the beginning. Now, the trend, unfortunately, is going in the wrong direction. If you see here these two charts, these are snapshots of the years 1988 and 2005. And you can see that the only segment of the human population that has actually gained is the top 5% segment. All other segments have lost, and the bottom quarter has lost the most. They've lost about one-third of their share of global household income, going from 1.16 in 1998 to 0.78% in 2005. Uh, here are the updated statistics for the graphically challenged in numbers. And you can see here for 1988 to 2008 that the bottom three deciles are very clear losers. And that, I think, is a very important point to keep in mind as you think about all the celebrations that are now ongoing about the Millennium Development Goals, right? How many millions we lifted out of poverty and how incredibly wonderful we've been over these 25 years between 1990 and 2005, so 2015, sorry. And the basic fact is that poor people, the bottom 30% of the world's population, would be considerably better off if they had merely participated proportionately in global economic growth. If they had just stayed fixed with their share of global household income, they would have done considerably better than they actually did. So maybe we did some heavy lifting, and maybe we lifted people out of poverty, but we did so on a descending escalator where the poor had their position shrunk, and it didn't shrink as much as it would have shrunk if we hadn't made these efforts. But we haven't even managed to make the poor stay in place in relative terms. In absolute terms, of course, they're better off, but less so than they would have been if they had participated proportionately in global economic growth. So the key facts, again, about the shift in the global income distribution is that the top 5% have gained more in terms of their share of global household income then the lower half of the human population even had left. They gained 3%, and the bottom half had left about 3%. The ratio of average incomes has exploded. The inequality has gotten a lot worse. The poorest 30% would be 21% better off if they had simply just maintained their position in relative terms. And had the shift that actually went on in favor of the top 5%, if that shift had instead favored the bottom 50%, then poverty would already be history. So the kind of shift that's needed to end poverty once and for all is of the same magnitude as the shift that actually occurred between 1988 and 2005, except that it went in the wrong direction. It was a shift in favor of the rich rather than the poor. Now, the problem of illicit financial flows is one problem among a whole bunch of problems that favors the rich over the poor. And these problems have to do with the way in which our global economy is structured. So there are a whole number of things, like, for example, grandfathering of protectionist measures, the permission to use protectionist measures for the rich countries, uh, the pharmaceutical regime, 
that we have now the TRIPS regime, which prevents the copying of generic medicines in poor countries for the poor, which was commonplace before the TRIPS agreement came into effect. Pollution rules, of course, favor the rich and disfavor the poor because the poor have the greatest burdens to bear from pollution, whereas the benefits of polluting activities go predominantly to the rich. Illicit financial flows. Then uh, the privileges that we assign to dictatorial rulers. We basically allow any person or group governing a country to sell the country's resources, regardless of whether they were elected or act in the interest of the people. And the arms trade also, of course, contributes to the stabilization of unsavory regimes that do not have the interests of the population at heart. So we have a supranational architecture that is certainly not designed with any attention to the interests of the poor. And that architecture shifts the global income distribution in favor of the rich and against the poor. And you might then, from a human rights point of view, say we are failing to fulfill what is a very fundamental human right, namely the right to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in the Universal Declaration can be fully realized. Now, why does that happen? I think an important part of the explanation is something quite familiar to everyone. That is the existence of inequality spirals. Uh, nobody is more familiar with those than uh, people in the United States. We know very well that we have a phenomenon of regulatory capture here. We have uh, election campaigns that are funded mostly by private campaign contributions. And of course, people who give large amounts of money, the last election was $6 billion for elections and politicians. These people think of that as an investment for the most part. They invest that money because they think that they can get a return. And they do it because they want to capture the rules or the application of those rules. They want the rules to be shaped in their own favor or the rules to be applied in their own favor. And in this game of regulatory capture, of trying to influence the rules, the rich have considerable advantages. They know more, they have more experience, and in particular, they have the advantage of economies of scale. So if we philosophy professors wanted to change the tax code to more, make it more favorable for philosophy professors, we would have to organize a very large number of philosophy professors. Forget the fact that they never agree on anything, so it would be hard to do. But even if we could get them to agree, to get the right amount of money together, we would need somewhere around 15,000 philosophy professors. For them, it would then be worthwhile to invest enough money to really make a dent in Washington to change tax rates. But if hedge fund managers face the same problem, how can we make the tax rules more favorable to hedge fund managers? It's a much easier problem, because with five or six hedge fund managers, you got enough money together. Right? It's a, a paying proposition, because each of them would save so much on a lower tax rate that they could afford to invest a million each or five million each and get enough money together to work on this. And I submit that it's not coincidental that we actually have a special tax rate for hedge fund managers. They pay 15% of the money that they make on capital gains of the people who invest with them on their share of these capital gains, whereas we don't have a special tax rate so far for philosophy professors, though I'm still waiting for one. Good, so inequality spirals, I think, are an important part of the problem. We have a the better opportunities for rich people to influence the rules in their own favor. This, in turn, increases their own economic position, makes them even more capable in the next round to influence the rules in their own favor, and so we can get runaway inequality. And to give you a sense of this actually happening, I will give you one example. The investment company Stratigas has constructed an index where they take from the S&P 500 those 50 companies out of 500 that relative to their assets spend the most money on lobbying. And so you select these companies every quarter and you put all your investment money into just those 50 companies. 
And then at the end of the quarter, you evaluate again and you shift, if you have to, to other companies who are the greatest lobbyists. Now, if you follow that investment strategy, you actually do considerably better than you do if you just invest in the S&P 500. Not a little bit better, but a lot better. So what you see here is that over that period of roughly 10 years, the S&P 500 went absolutely nowhere. It just stayed flat, thanks to the big financial crisis, of course. But the Stratagas index went up somewhere around 300% and just totally trounced the S&P 500 index. As if this weren't enough, here's an academic study that makes the same point. Uh, it's often very hard to assess how much gain people who lobby actually get, right? They invest a certain amount of money. You may be able to trace that money uh, through corporate reports, for example, but it's difficult to assess you know, how much money did they actually make? How much was it really worth to them? But here's an example where we could trace that pretty precisely, or these three economists could. It's the American Jobs Creation Act of 2004, a very spectacularly misnamed piece of legislation. And what that act did is it basically allowed multinational corporations to repatriate profits into the United States at a discount. It's a tax holiday where instead of paying the usual 35% taxes, they paid 5.25% taxes, 85% less than normal. So a bunch of companies that had money accumulated in tax havens abroad uh, wanted that money to come home and they went to the Congress and said, you know, we want to create jobs, we would really, we, we feel very patriotic these days and we want to do something for the American economy. Can you just not help us to bring this money home and uh, do something good for America? And so with a little bit of extra money as a persuasive tool, these companies then prevailed upon the Congress to pass this legislation and we know exactly how much money they invested in that effort because that is stated in the corporate reports. And we also know exactly how much money they saved on this enterprise because we can simply look at how much money they brought home and how much it would have cost them in taxes and how much it actually cost them in taxes. So the ratio between those two amounts is 220 to one. So for every single dollar that they invested in lobbying, they got $220 back in terms of a tax reduction. That is a pretty good rate of return by anybody's standards. So mechanisms like that, lobbying uh, inequality spirals, then lead to this amazing boost in inequality also in this country. It's not just globally, but also domestically in the United States that inequality has increased tremendously. And you can see here that that inequality increase is very heavily concentrated at the very top. So the top 1% has made out really well. They have increased uh, their share of income quite considerably. But the top 10th of 1% or the top 100th of 1% have done much better still. So the top 100th of 1% has increased their share sevenfold. That's particularly remarkable because inequality was on a downward trend for the whole period between 1928 and 1978 in the aftermath of the Great Depression. And that has reversed. That was partly, of course, jump-started by the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, but it was then further accelerated by, I think, globalization. So. Uh, I've got, yeah, it was further uh, increased by globalization and basically what happened here is that we have now a whole new ball game in which lobbying can be effective, namely global rule shaping. So most lobbying before the period of globalization was focused on national rules, changing the national rules in such a way that you uh, get, uh, make the rules more favorable to yourself, get a larger share of national household income, but now there is a very dense and very influential network of rules and regulations at the global level which can also become subject to lobbying. And companies spend a lot of effort lobbying the same old governments they've always lobbied, but lobbying these governments not with respect to internal rules, domestic rules, but with regard to international rules. 
And in this realm of international rulemaking, lobbying is in fact in many ways more successful, more promising, because you have there no democratic counterweight and you have very little transparency. This happens, the treaty making, agreement making, rule making happens behind closed doors. The public doesn't know during the negotiations what is being negotiated and even afterwards it's very difficult to find out which country pushed for what features of the agreement that finally emerged. So all countries can in the end say, well, you know, this was the best agreement we could get, or this was what emerged from the negotiations. And in this sort of intransparent environment, lobbyists and also those whom they lobby can easily hide their tracks and therefore act with a certain, without any kind of accountability. A further nice feature about, from the point of view of lobbyists, about the international realm is that moral arguments can much more easily be dismissed, right? You can just say that international relations is a jungle. We are unfortunately competing with people like the Chinese, for example, and so we cannot afford to be nice, we cannot afford to be moral in, for example, taking the interests of poor populations into account, because if we do so, we will in the long run fail to prevail against the Chinese, right? You've all heard the story about the Chinese now being in Africa, and the Chinese are not, repeat, not moral in Africa. It's absolutely scandalous, and so we, of course, now have to, since we are competing with them, we can no longer be moral in Africa either. Okay, so I'll conclude with a few ideas about how one might uh, put these points into practice. One discussion that's now ongoing is about the successes of the 2015 expiring uh, MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. We are looking for successor goals that are supposed to cover the period from 2015 to 2030. And here are a few ideas about how one might bring these goals in. I mean, Raymond has already mentioned a few of these uh, ideas. Uh, we could think about an alternative minimum tax for corporations that would say that all multinational corporations have to pay a certain share of their profits, of their worldwide profits as taxes, and whatever they pay nationally will be subtracted from that global amount. So it works similar to an American alternative minimum tax that we are already paying but would essentially make sure that every multinational corporation pays at least, let's say, 10% of their profits in taxes, no matter how intelligently they reshuffle their profits into uh, low-tax jurisdictions. Uh, beneficial ownership, uh, Raymond has already mentioned. Uh, we could have a rule according to which only minimally representative rulers can take out loans in behalf of the whole country. Or to put it the other way around, countries would no longer be held responsible for debts incurred by dictatorial rulers who have really no legitimacy given how they came to power and how they rule. That would at least prevent the countries from being settled with these additional burdens that come from uh, these rulers taking out large loans. And of course, often these loans are put straight into foreign bank accounts. They're not used for the benefit of the country. It would also reduce the staying power of such rulers. And finally, the same thing for natural resources. Uh, maybe disqualify such rulers from selling the natural resources of their country or at the very least put an extra tax or uh, fee on selling or buying such natural resources to discourage the purchase of natural resources that really belong to the people by those who rule these people against their will. Now, uh, we did uh, recently a report. This is the uh, a report on tax abuses, poverty, and human rights. This was done by the Task Force on Illicit Financial Flows, Poverty, and Human Rights, set up by the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute, where we laid out in some detail the connection between the illicit financial flows problem and the problems of poverty and human rights, in particular human rights violating poverty. And I have about 40 of these reports lying behind me. If anybody's interested in one, you can pick one up at the end of the session. Thank you. Mm -hmm.